You've got big projects to tackle, but your day gets swallowed up by repetitive tasks and constant inquiries. It's hard to make progress when you're stuck putting out fires. That's where Element 451's AI assistants come in. Acting like an extra set of hands, you get your time back for the high-impact projects. Ready to reclaim your time? Visit element451.com slash AI team to learn more. Hi, I'm a higher ed social media manager, and I have a confession. As crisis management takes up more and more of my job, I feel like I've gotten stale in the areas of creativity and experimentation, which I feel are really, really important in social media. Today, my guest is Kate Myers Emery, the Senior Digital Communications Manager at Candid. Kate weaves experimentation into her social media strategy so it's a constant in her day to day workflow. I wanted to ask her how she keeps innovating. Welcome to Confessions of a Higher Ed Social Media Manager, a podcast that addresses the do's, don'ts, and dynamics of the digital ecosystem specific to higher education. I'm your host, Jenny Lee Fowler. Join me every other week for discussions with some of the best minds in higher education social media management and marketing. Confessions of a Higher Ed Social Media Manager is a part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at Enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at Element451.com. Hey, Kate, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jenny. I am so excited to be here today. Yeah, I'm super excited about this conversation, too. At first, uh, we want to learn more about you. So tell us what led you to pursue a career in social media. So I've always had an interest in digital tools and data and using them to tell stories and reach new audiences. You know, I think like my first foray into this was learning HTML so I could make a Sailor Moon fan site so I could connect (laughs) with the community. I think I did something similar. That is really funny. Yeah, it's it's deeply nerdy, but I love it. And with that, you know, I decided to pursue a career in mortuary archaeology initially. So the study of cemeteries. So I actually have a PhD in archaeology. But while I was doing that, I used a lot of interesting digital tools to study these things. I was sharing a lot of interesting things on like social media to share what I was learning and also pay for grad school. I ended up just taking on a lot of random digital jobs because I was young and I wasn't scared of tech and they needed someone to do it. And part of that was running social media accounts for various university departments. And at the end of the degree, you know, I was on the way to doing tenure track interviews and was like, I'm going to be in academia and was like, you know what? I am not up for that. I'm going to (laughs) go instead. And so I decided that I wanted to go into digital social media, but have like a social impact education side to it. So got a job at a museum and then was lucky enough to get a job at Candid doing organic social media which has been really exciting. You know, for people who don't know, Candid is a nonprofit that helps nonprofits find funding, helps funders find nonprofit, and gets everyone the data that they need to do their work better. So for me, it's that perfect mix of like data nerd and social impact helping people. I have to say you're speaking my language. So uh, how do you approach creating a social media strategy? Yeah, so my approach to candid social media strategy is almost like planning like a road trip. So first I think about the goal, you know, where do I want to be in a year from now? So this year, Candid is really trying to drive traffic to our Candid Insights articles. So I'm really into like link clicks and engagement. So then I take a look at what happened last year. You know, what was the the top posts? 
Where did we come from? What does the data say? What's working? What's not? And based on that, I'll create, you know, my my itinerary, my road trip of, you know, here's a one-page flexible document, living document on, like, what I think we're going to need to do for the next year to be successful. And then as we're going throughout this, I'll run experiments probably every month or every few months that may change the road trip, that may change the direction we're taking to try to reach that goal. You know, if an experiment is successful, I'll loop it back into the strategy and add it in and it will become part of that living document. And if it's not, I'll take what I can from it. I'll glean as much as I can get and discard what isn't helpful. One thing that I love that you do is that you weave experimentation into like the fabric of your strategy. Can you talk about that a little bit more and why it's a priority? You know, social media is such a a fickle beast that we're all like <laughs> trying to tame. And yes. the approach that, you know, Candid is really taking towards it is to just be always trying new things and never kind of settling because there is no settling in social media. There's no one and done magic thing, no matter what the like experts might say on LinkedIn. Like there's no perfect plan. So really, you're kind of always making small adjustments. So instead of just kind of making these off the cuff adjustments, we're really planning them out. We're making these very formalized experiences, which is probably based on like me having a PhD and like everything needs to be a spreadsheet. Everything needs to be <laughs> everything needs Excellent. To a bigger plan to it. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a really great thing. And Candid is very into like innovating and trying new things. So I have a lot of room to experiment and just try things and see what happens. Yeah, I think that's really important. And just to confirm further what you said, like something that worked six months ago may not work for us, you know, now, or something that works for MIT might not work for, you know, the another university or institution. So I think that experimentation is really, really important. But I think it's, I think you're right. I think a lot of us are kind of doing it off the cuff, right? We're saying this didn't, or this worked. I wonder, let's try it again. Okay. And, or, or, you know, why didn't this work or why let's try something different, but it's not, it's not a formula. And we're definitely, I'm definitely not making spreadsheets on it, which I am, am very jealous of. So can can you give us a, like a, an example of experimentation within social media? Definitely. So last year, Candid decided to take a big swing at doing short form video on TikTok, real shorts. You know, everyone says you got to be on video, but we just weren't sure if it was the right decision for our audience, if we had the capacity to even take it on. So we decided that over a three-month period, we would be all in on video. We would create a short video that would release every single d weekday. And we wanted to see double the engagement that we had to static posts, a 2,000 follower increase on each of the platforms, and we also wanted to take less than 15% of my time. Um, so the course of the three months, we stuck to it. We made our videos. In the end, we made 82 videos, which was amazing. And what ended up happening, though, was, you know, we met the engagement. We were able to double it. We got nearly the number of followers we were hoping for. But it took about 30% of my time. Mm -hmm. And for staff mm -hmm. members that were, like, our on-screen talent, we were hoping it would be, you know, under 30 minutes per video. And for some, it was way over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we ended that experiment saying, you know, we, we can't take it on. We can't do it. It doesn't fit within our capacity, even though it gets great engagement and our audience is really enjoying it. You know, if you don't have the time, you can't do it. Um, so actually, you know, Candid stopped doing short form video for about three months. And in that period, we reevaluated, you know, my workload and other people's and we were able to move things around. So now we are doing video. But it's it's at a smaller amount. So it's, you know, twice a week instead of five times. Right. So I love that. I love that you actually made decisions based off of what 
the results of the experiment. And you said, and you didn't just go, oh, well, it's, a, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a time suck, but we still need you to do it, which is not productive, right? So um, how do you, how do you get that mindset of everyone on the team? Like, look, this is what we've learned from it. And here, you know, here's what we can sort of shape from our findings. Yeah, I think a big part of that is I talk a lot about, you know, embracing failure. It's a big thing that, you know, I talked about with folks when I was doing training in like digital humanities and using like different technologies of like, if you're going to be making new things and trying new things and innovating, you're going to have fails along the way. And it's not really a fail, though, if you can glean mm-hmm, some mm-hmm. positive stuff from it. I, I agree. I, I think as soon as you learn from some something, it's not a failure the minute you learn from it, you know, from it. It's part of the process. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like um, we at Candid recently did an experiment with threads because I've just been like thinking over and over like, oh, should we be on threads? Should we be using it? Should we invest more? And we created all this content. We used it a lot over the course of two months. I think we were posting four times a day. And it just wasn't there. The audience wasn't liking it. But we were able to take all that content we made for threads and use it on YouTube as posts. And it did amazing there. So what we had created was being used and it was valuable. And now that question I had in my head of like, should we be on there? Should we do this? Like, that's gone. I know now. I have the data and the data says no. So I listen to data, <laughs> you know, and I do tell a lot of people to to lead with data. I mean, it sounds like when it comes from you, like people just appreciate your authority and that's sort of, that's sort of the end all be all. Do you have any recommendations for maybe junior social media managers that like once they do the experiment and they get the data, like how they can build their argument? I, I think there's a lot of educating up in social media because often supervisors don't understand. They have not, you know, had a career or background in social media. And finding kind of kind ways to educate them on like what these measures mean and why they are important, that to me has been kind of the best way to get things across of like really explaining like, here's what this is and here's what it means in context. I also like to lead with the positive. So, you know, like this isn't a fail. This is, you know, a step. It's a step in a direction. We've got this data now, and that means we can do more with it. So I like to, you know, lead with, hey, you know, Threads wasn't a failure. We got all this great content we can use on YouTube, and we got this content that we can use in other places. So really trying to, like, make that balance of, like, sharing maybe what might be negative news or data they don't want to hear but reframing it as like, here's what we're learning from this. You know, here's what we're going to do to make it better next time. And perhaps this is what we've learned now and maybe we'll revisit in a year. Does that ever yes. come across a conversation? Definitely. You know, we have, you know, tried things again. We've had some okay. posts that we have just completely reshared the next year and have gotten completely different results from it. So sometimes when we have things that we think should be successful or that are really important to Candid and to us as an organization, we'll try sharing them again. Maybe it was summer break and things were weird. Maybe elections were happening and people weren't focused on your organization. So, you know, your audience also shifts. The platforms also shift. What worked as content last year doesn't always work this year. So, yeah, I think, you know, reusing content, reposting is so important to kind of always be reevaluating where you are. Yeah, you're the second person on the show to give that great advice. Like Jacob Shipley uh, actually mentioned something similar. So I think that's even more proof to, you know, use content again and again, right? Especially successful content. I think that's a great reminder for all of us. Um, but it, it does sound like you're constantly iterating and experimenting. And one thing that I find challenging is to keep that process like fresh and to, you know, stay creative. Do you have any tips or like, how do you do that? I find that looking to kind of expert advice 
is a great way to get started with experiments. I mean, you see all this advice on LinkedIn and X and other platforms from social media experts. And for the most part, I find, you know, a lot of this advice only works for large organizations with big teams and big budgets. But I think it's a good starting point for a question. So, you know, experts say we should be on video. Should we? Does that actually work for our audience? You know, experts are saying you should post 10 times a day on Instagram stories. Should we? Should we do that? So I think reframing advice as questions is one of like the best ways that Candid gets its experiments. I like that. It's funny because a lot of times when people say I should do something, I, if I, I'm like, you know, when someone says you should do something, it's usually something someone else wants you to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I like that the skepticism, you know, it's like, should we be doing this? And you're like, hmm, should we? I like that. And so I guess it almost sounds like you're constantly sort of challenging that, like, instead of just blatantly accepting what might be considered a best practice. And I'm I'm using air quotes, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think I think the air cro- quotes are key when it comes to best practices because there really aren't best practices. There are best practices for your organization, and you know some things that work really well for your organization might be completely against best practices. You know, Candid has these educational carousels that we post every week, and it's just black text on a yellow background, and they share, you know four to five key takeaways of things that we think nonprofits would benefit from, like seven red flags for funders and grant writing or how to ask Mm. your board to help with fundraising. And we've had, I think, probably, you know, five different experts at this point come to us and be like, you know, those aren't very trendy. But every week, it's our most popular post. It's our most saved post. People love them. They share them. They refer back to them. They constantly talk about them. Like, it's it's the most loved post we do. So I think, you know, for us, that's the best practice. Posting yeah, is, I, is part of our core strategy. Well, I think your audience is telling you that they like those. That's the content they like from you. So why not keep doing that? I, I 100% agree with that. Um, so I, I have a logistics question because I love the fact that you're saying, okay, you know, vertical videos are big, you know, I think we should experiment with this idea and see if we have the resources, see if we can maintain it. So the experiment actually kind of would take a big chunk of your time. So what, how do you lay the ground? Do you have a conversation with your supervisor that says, look, I'm going to experiment with this. So for this brief, I don't even know, three month period or six month period, can we take this off of my plate? Because there are a lot of you know, social media managers that are one person communications team. So how do you even logistically sort of go about that? You know, I think it is a challenging thing. When we were running the video experiment, it was 30% of my time. I mean, that's a Mm -hmm. huge amount of time to dedicate to something that, you know, in the end didn't work for us. And I think I'm lucky enough that, you know, Candid is very into experiments, and we're totally up for this. Uh, We actually have an innovation fund, so staff members can apply to get time and resources to run Mm -hmm. experiments. But with kind of the, like, the other experiments that we've done, it really is just an upfront, honest conversation of, hey, we're getting asked about this, or this is something that might be valuable. And we talk about, you know, for this period of time, what could shift off my plate? What could we maybe do less of? What maybe isn't working at the moment that we could say, hey, can we set that aside or can someone else take it on? So, you know, if if the organization really wants to invest in a new platform, if they really want to take on a new content type, you're going to need that space anyway. <laughs> like at some point, you're going to have to free up that time. So this at least is a way of doing it that like, hey, this might only be two months two months, can we, you know, post a little less somewhere else so we can see if this is a better direction for us? 
Yeah, that seems like a lighter commitment or not such a great commitment, right? And I, and I do and I do still sort of question, not question, but when you say it didn't work out for you, I think there was you learned so much, right? You learned how much time or if it becomes a priority, right? Like you need extra resources and you have the data to back that up, which I think is incredibly helpful for social media managers who are in higher ed if they if they know you know, if their supervisor says vertical video is a priority and they learn like this is taking up 30 more percent of my day. And if it's really, really important, then maybe we should set aside freelance money for it. Or Right. There's that sort of learning. So I love that experimentation. I, I think I'm going, you know, to build it into my workflow a little bit more about, you know, asking for a period of time, right, to look into things. Is there anything that I, like I that we didn't mention or didn't bring up that you really want to talk about with our audience or talk about like your what you do? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think is kind of key to our strategy and the way that Candid does experimentation is that you can't take social media too personally or be too precious with anything. If you're going to have this experimentation mindset, you have to be okay with like, letting something you love go and be okay that things are going to shift, which I think can be a little bit hard as social media managers. You know, we're we're very invested in what we produce. And especially, you know, if we're the on-screen talent, it becomes very personal. So finding ways to like distance yourself a little bit from the work and not getting too emotionally invested and being like, okay, this can change. Like, I love doing these trending audio videos, but our audience isn't liking them anymore. So I need to give them up. I think that is like an important part of this experimentation is just, you know, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about the algorithm. <laughs> it's about your audience. It's your audience. Yeah. It's, you know, the vibes of social media on any given day. You just, some days you don't know what you're going to wake up to and what's going to work. And, you know, being okay with letting things go, I think is very important to this. Kate, there is wisdom in that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Well, since we are confessions of a higher ed social media manager, Kate, I need to ask you, what is your confession? Oh, I'm almost like embarrassed to say this, but um, oh, no. my per- you're among friends. <laughs> <laughs> my personal phone doesn't have any social media apps on it. <laughs> I need to know how you do this. This is a whole other conversation. That's awesome. Yeah, I you know, and I even have an app blocker on my phone, so I can't even open social media on a browser. It's just a full stop, no social media on my personal phone. And honestly, it was because I started to recognize that I would go through these cycles of burnout with social media where I would find myself like lacking creativity and not being able to produce and just feeling like, oh, I can't make anything good anymore. And at that same time, I would be on social media more because I'm, you know, trying to escape from the pressure and I'm trying to, you know quote, get inspired Mm -hmm. by scrolling, but really I wasn't. And you you can't fix social media burnout by doing more social media. So I dropped dropped all of my apps when I went on vacation this past year, and I never put them back on. I just found that my life was healthier when, you know, if I'm not at work, I step away from social media completely. And you don't miss it. I... I feel FOMO for it, but I know. Okay, I appreciate appreciate the honesty. I do. But you feel healthier. Like your your mind is more clear. Yeah, I have not. Since I did that, I haven't had these like moments of burnout, which I used to have regularly. You know, like every six months I'd get into this funk. It's true. And I don't have that. I haven't had that this past year. I mean, there are times when like, I'll take a photo and be like, I wish I could share that to Instagram. (laughs) But you know, it's okay. Nobody is looking for that content from me. Work stuff is going great. I still do LinkedIn. I only do it from my computer browser, though. And I set very strict time limits. But yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm 
I'm feeling good with it and I feel mentally healthier. You know, I think also partially this comes from like me being a little bit like later in my career and having more experience. So I have the privilege of stepping away a little more. You know, people aren't judging me on my own personal accounts as much as they used to when I was like just starting out. (laughs) <laughs> like nobody cares anymore if I have a cool Instagram. But, you know, I would also add, like, if you want longevity in this profession, you really do need to put up some guardrails. It's important. Yes, it's yeah. so true. And I don't think people talk about that enough of like, if you plan on doing this for your entire career, like, yeah, you got to find a way to be healthy with social media and Just because we know all of the toxic tricks that social media has, it doesn't mean that we're also not susceptible to them. Mm -hmm. Like I get sucked into TikTok just as much as any other person, even though I know how they make it addictive because I make videos that use those tricks. But it doesn't matter. You know, if you feel like it's affecting your mental health, then it's time to step away for a little bit and, you know, do an experiment. See if it works. Say you'll do it for a month. (laughs) We've come full circle, and I I love that confession. Bravo. It's goals, for sure. Kate, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. I loved loved our conversation. I loved having you. Thank you. I was so pleased to be able to do this, and this was so much fun talking to you. Confessions of a Higher Ed Social Media Manager is part of the Enrollify podcast network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month and we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Jamie Hunt, Allison Tercio, Mallory Wilsey, and so many others of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.